OK, mapping. Um, so this is uh, this thing here. I'm going to talk about condition-specific data and mapping to a generic measure. OK. Right. Um, so mapping invol involves establishing the relationship between t two series of numbers or two measures, A and B, and using that relationship to predict values uh, for A using the observed values for B. It's a simple concept. You can map between generic measures. You can map from SF6D to the 5D. Or, more, more usefully, perhaps, you can map from condition-specific measures to a generic measure. For example, you can map, there's a condition-specific measure used for rheumatoid arthritis called the HAC, or Health Assessment Questionnaire. You can map from that to an EQ5D. The motivation is that quite frequently, uh, we have trial data that didn't include measures such as EQ5D, but did include some condition-specific measures. And so we might then, uh, it's quite attractive to take the data we do have and transform it or translate it, map it into EQ5D data we don't have. The main alternative to mapping would be just to go to literature and so go away from the actual trial data you've got and go to the literature and see what scores people have assigned to, to the relevant health states. So mapping is potentially useful. Um, I'll give you a cancer example. And it's been particularly, mapping's been particularly widely used in the area of cancer because it used to be quite standard that measures of um, health states, such as EQ5D, were not collected in cancer trials. It's now changed substantially and they are being collected. But there's no fewer than 13 different studies have developed mapping algorithms from a specific cancer measure, the QLQ C30, Quality of Life Questionnaire C30, to the EQ5D. And another cancer measure is the FACT, or Functional Assessment of Cancer Therapy. And it's, there's been 10 different studies the last time I looked mapping from FACT or FACT measures to EQ5D. So it's been quite a, a cottage industry. Uh, the QLQC30, some of you may have come across, very widely used in cancer studies. And the C30 refers to C for core and 30, 30 items. And so there's um, a grouping of items or questions for physical functioning, role functioning, emotional functioning, cognitive functioning, social functioning. There's some symptom-specific items, nausea, vomiting, pain, fatigue, and then there's some single items. One that always puzzles me slightly is financial difficulties. It sort of stands out like a sore thumb among all the rest. There's also um, two items, two questions about general health, which is also slightly odd. You've gone through all these, presumably because you think it's something to do with health, and then you ask about general health. But anyway, that's QLQC30, really quite widely used. Uh, and cancer-specific, or designed to be cancer-specific. So a lot of these things either are a consequence of the cancer or a consequence of the treatments that are typical of the cancer. Hence the nausea and vomiting is very common with the treatments and fatigue is very common as well. I'll give you one, one example. These are actually some former colleagues of mine in Aberdeen, um, Linda McKenzie and Marion van der Poel. They did this mapping study hmm, quite a few years, almost a decade ago now. And um, they are mapping from the QLQC30 to the EQ5D. And they had data for about 200 patients who had inoperable esophageal cancer. And they had four or five observations per patient over time. So sort of some longitudinal data. And they explored four possibilities. 
Uh, the first one is to try and predict the EQ5D overall score uh, on the basis of the functional scale scores, the symptom scale scores, etc. Another possibility is to try and predict um, the dimension on each level, uh, the level on each dimension. So the mobility score, the usual activity score, etc. Again, using the same variables. And then they repeated that study, the overall score and the dimension score, but using just the individual items rather than the group data. Because they, they were trying to work out what seems to work best. And what they found was fairly similar results, whether they used the um, group data or the 30 individual items. Um, they then tested the, the first the predictions in the first two models in a separate set of data. So they had um, data for about 250 patients who'd had surgery for breast cancer. And again, they had about four observations per patient over time. And they found that both models, so that's uh, these two models here, both these models um, over-predicted, but the um, dimension model over-predicted more. So in the end, they decided this was their preferred model, predicting the overall score and using the, the group data rather than the 30 items. They then did one final thing, which is quite interesting. They took data from um, a breast cancer trial where they did have EQ5D, but they also had QLQC30. And so they were able to compare the predicted quality change using mapping, able to compare that with the actual quality change because they'd, they had collected the EQ5D data. And what they found was really very similar results. So on average, across patients, between the control arm and the intervention arm, the change in qualities was 0.19 when they used the EQ5D. But when they predicted what the EQ5D would have been on the basis of the QLQ C30 data, they got an answer of 0.17. And so that's pretty close. Now, of course, that could just be chance, but uh, they took that as support that mapping appeared to be working quite well. Now, of course, you wouldn't map if you didn't have to. If you have the actual data, you'd use the data. But if you haven't got the EQ5D or whichever measure you're using data, you might want to map because it gives you an opportunity to still calculate your qualities using this measure. Um, if you're interested in mapping, there's a website here that maintains a, a database of such studies. Uh, looking across studies in general, what they tend to find is with map data, the confidence intervals around um, predicted values tend to be narrower than the confidence intervals for the scores for particular health states using actual EQ5D data. So you're sort of losing, I think, some information and you're perhaps getting a false sense of certainty. You're understating uncertainty. Um, but I think the key point is, whenever you use mapping in an economic evaluation, you've introduced more uncertainty because there's uncertainty about the algorithm. There's uncertainty about the relationship you've estimated between the cancer specific, if it's cancer study, between the condition specific data and the EQ5D. And so it's a, it's a second best. It's not, it's not a really a desirable thing to do. But if you haven't got the alternative of the actual data, perhaps it's a useful option to map, uh, albeit you're going to introduce additional uncertainty.